Hi, it's Dr. Katherine D. Harris. This is English 10, Great Works of Literature, Techno Literature. This is an introductory lecture on the Gothic tradition, Satan, and Byronic heroes. So the Gothic tradition is where we're really starting when we're talking about techno literature. Last week, you guys defined your own versions of technology and literature, but what do we do with science and education and power, and how does that roll itself into this idea of technology that we have today? So we're opening up the semester by talking about one of the greatest scientific novels of all time, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, published in 1818. But before we get to that, this is a British-born author and published a book in London and so we're going to start with the 18th century, the 1700s that is, into the 19th century and give you a little background for this very first mini, mini little lecture. So the Gothic tradition really expands on this idea of horror and terror. Now these are two different things. Horror contracts, freezes, and nearly annihilates faculties. Terror expands the soul and awakens faculties to a high degree of life. So horror is physical fear, uh, a physical pain. Terror is pain is fear that's more, much more psychological. So horror and terror. Terror is psychological. Horror is physical. Now keep this in mind as we move throughout the 19th, 20th, and 21st century. What does it mean to, for humanity to interact with technology? What does it create for ourselves? Okay. Back to the Gothic tradition, their originators were really Horace Walpole with a little book called Castle of Otranto in 1764. It's very short. It's about a haunted, usurped castle, and it's also a pastiche. It, there's a knight, there's mistaken identity, there's the damsel in distress, there's the unexplained things. Uh, why does the Gothic novel reach a fevered pitch in the 1790s? Well, for one reason, we have the French Revolution and just across the English Channel. That just made the British extremely mm, anxious. They thought that the French Revolution was going to skip over to them. Now, the French Revolution was particularly bloody. We also have Napoleon, who's about to come up with the French as well. So then we also have the invention of a new type of literature with the Marquis de Sade. Have you guys ever heard of the Marquis de Sade? Have you ever heard of sadomasochism? Well, he's a French playwright who actually brings these kinds of things to the stage. And the British, though they say that they hate the French, loved these plays. He says the, ne the necessary fruits of the revolutionary tremors were felt by the whole of Europe. He pushed novelists to new extremes to compete with shocking reality. But some novels predate the, the French Revolution with the Gothic. And here's a little bit uh, about why. Typically, the Gothic novel was referred to as a romance during the late 18th century and the early 19th century. It's based on artificial diction, numerous coincidences, promiscuous mixing of history and fiction. And this is really important for us because there haven't been a lot of advancements in technology in the way that there were in the 20th century. So in the 18th and 19th century, the invention of the the pen is going to be massive at the end of the 19th century. So far, how are they doing their writing? Have you guys ever tried to write with a quill pen? It's, it's not so great. So continuing on with the Gothic, Gothic tradition and this idea of romance, it's the fusion of the probable with the improbable, it's absurd idealism, and it's over-the-top heroics. Now, a lot of the people who are really the great liter literary authors of the 18th and 19th century in England during this time said that the Gothic novel and the romance tradition were totally bunk because they thought that novel, that genre form that we read all the time now, was really meant more towards realism. Now, I note from your blog post last week that a lot of you defined literature as a way to escape. But here, in the 18th and 19th century, they initially thought that the novel should represent real life. Now, who wants to read about cholera and people who don't have a plumbing system? Um, well, actually, we probably would, wouldn't we? We would find that a little bit fascinating. Now, technology is everything from the 19th century. We want to think about it as a very basic. The Gothic novel and these romance novels were available as chat books. That means that they were bastardized tales. They would reduce an 800-page novel that would be very expensive to buy down to something like 80 pages. Can you imagine Frankenstein reduced down to, I don't know, 20 pages? What would you leave in? Would you cut out the whole th scenes with Clerval and Elizabeth? Would you just get to the stuff with the monster or the creature and Walton and Victor?
Now, these things circulated, the chapbooks and the novels, um, very easily through the Minerva Press Library from 1773 to 1820. This meant that you had to go and pay a subscription to be part, a yearly member of the library, and then you had to also rent, pay to rent out all of these books. Now, I said before, there were not that many books. Maybe there were 500 a year novels that were published. Really, if you were educated, you read poetry. You didn't read the newspapers. You certainly didn't read magazines. It's just for entertainment. What you wanted literature to do in the 18th and early 19th century was to educate. But more and more, the Gothic novel and the Gothic tradition completely undermined that, and suddenly people thought, I'm going to read for entertainment. And entertainment meant that you had leisure time. And so you became part of the middle class because you owned a library of books. So the elements of this Gothic tradition or this Gothic novel are tightly wound around the developments of technology itself, scientific discoveries about the body. Now, get this, they didn't really know in the 19th century how uh, pregnancy occurred. And so they would do things like cut a deceased pregnant woman in half with the baby still in utero to discover everything about it. Now, guess what? Guess who went to these kinds of presentations? Mary Shelley. And she was very fascinated with it, and we're going to see that come up with uh, Frankenstein, too. But the elements of the Gothic novel, especially the way Mary Shelley picked them up, are nostalgia or a fascination with the past, the st of structure or architecture or landscape that takes on a life of its own, eccentric, supernatural, magical, sublime, inter intermingled with realistic, psychological insights, especially into sexuality, fear, horror, the macabre and sinister, emotional, not rational, uh, exotic settings and locations. None of Frankenstein takes place in England. It takes place in the wilds of Ireland and Scotland, but that's not England, by the way, the British define it. Now, the Americans stick to this idea of the domestic Gothic. Things happen in the woods. As I'm reading off this list, you should be thinking about movies that employ the gothic and horror and terror and also all of our science fiction. If you've never seen Alien, that's the quintessential science fiction movie. Nobody can hear you scream in space, but it also uses a sense of technology that just underwrites development of, of knowledge and science. So continuing with the gothic novel, it, con it contains female victimization. The Gothic hero is the archetypal Byronic hero, and that Byronic hero is a wanderer who shuns society's rules and he's melancholic. Now, when I spoke to you guys last week, I showed you uh, a slideshow that had a definition, a long definition of the Byronic hero, so go back and reference that if you need to.